Many thanks, Sonia, for the demo and to the previous presenters and contributors. Hi all, um, my name is Patrick Mara and I work within the global engineering team for Novartis. And in addition to my normal day job, I'm also the Pharma Ledger EPI use case co-lead, along with Kent Persby from MSD, uh, who presented earlier. Over the next few minutes, and I will try to keep it as short and to the point as possible, I would like to go over the EPI product pipeline and the market adoption approach with you. However, beforehand, I would like to clarify some terms that you may have heard mentioned by some of the previous presenters, um, specifically the enterprise wallet. So what exactly do we mean when we say the enterprise wallet? Essentially, this is the source of the trusted information that is presented on the mobile app. Um, this is the regulatory approved information in the case of EPI that the manufacturer makes available. This information does not come from some unknown or untrusted website. It comes straight from the manufacturer. From the pharmaceutical company's perspective, we need to load this data from our approved and validated systems of record into the enterprise wallet in order for it to be made available. It is also probably worth mentioning at this point that the EPI or the serial numbers, etc., are not actually loaded on the blockchain. What is loaded on the blockchain is a pointer to the location within the controlled and trusted environment where the data is stored. This is what Sonia was referring to when she was talking about the hash or the anchor. I can't remember which of the terms she actually used, but I believe it was one of the two of those. Now, I hope this rather high-level clarification helped, and I do apologize to the technical ex experts out there for my rather untechnical clarification. Um, before I continue to present what I was actually asked to present, I would like to mention two more things that are quite important. The first one are the different types of barcodes that we're looking at. In the presentations and in the demo, you'd have seen the use of the GS1 data matrix code. The reason for this is rather straightforward because this is essentially the de facto standard used for serialization across the globe. However, as we all know, it is not the only barcode in the marketplace. Therefore, from a pharma ledger perspective, from an adoption perspective, we are looking to, at using different barcode types. For example, we have the composite code that's used in Japan. We also have the data matrix code that is used for Russia serialization. And this differs slightly from what we have for the EU and for the US, for example. And then we have the 1D code that is used for China serialization. We also have the codes that are used on many OTC products. So essentially, this covers the different types of barcodes that we, Pharma Ledger, are looking at utilizing. The last point is the app, and I think this is really quite important for people to understand. While you've seen the Farmer Ledger EPI app that has been developed, Sonia presented this just previously, it is not the intention this will be the only app. We're not interested in creating the one app to rule all apps. Um, where a country or market have a, an existing app, then we will be looking to integrate this. This aids with market adoption. So now let me get back to what I'm actually here to present, and apologies for the slight diversion. Um, before I start, I would like to ask the following question, which you can see on Slido. We presented today our vision for a trusted, sustainable healthcare platform. So the question to all of you is, would EPI plus the additional features create more value to society? So let's start by looking at the product pipeline. Unfortunately, during this session, I can't give any timelines for these features, as this needs to be agreed and prioritized with the various stakeholders. Additionally, the development activities may, in some instances, depend on the selected pilot markets or markets. I won't go through all of these topics in detail, and we can be sure that additional features and functionality will most certainly be added as we engage with different stakeholders and get feedback from the various proof of concepts and pilots that we will be running. It is, however, worth highlighting a couple of the new features. As the saying goes, a video is worth a thousand pictures. And with that in mind, we are looking to develop the ability to show videos that would aid in the usage or disposal of the product, as, as, as examples. This actually raises an interesting question as to how the video content would be approved by the regulatory authorities, or if indeed it needs to be approved at all. Now, as Sonia mentioned during the demo, we're looking at developing the ability to perform adverse event reporting and also the add to cabinet functionality. Um, the thought behind the adverse event reporting is twofold. First of all, to make this process much easier for the end user or the person wishing to report the adverse event. Second of all, as we have scanned the barcode on the pack, then we, have, we can provide much more details automatically, such as the batch number, the expiration date, the product code, or even the serial number. Of course, this depends on the barcode that's actually used on the pack. Now, the thought process behind the Add to Cabinet functionality was to provide us a location where the patient could store all the information related to the medicines that they are taking. Now, all of these features require additional investigation, so if anyone is interested in contributing, then please reach out to Pharma Ledger. 
As you can see, there are quite a number of ideas in the pipeline. We can roughly break these down into three main categories. The first category would be features or functions that users of the app would see or experience. The second category would be functionality or business processes that the pharma companies would need to consider. Uh, the third category would be company and market adoption agnostic functionality that any solution would need to have, typically around security, user management, etc. I believe that there is a planned webinar for early 2022, which will go into the details behind these features and the underlying technology. So please make sure to watch out for that webinar. You can also see that performance optimization is a key area that we'll be looking into. Of course, this is not a function per se. I hope this gives you an insight into what is coming. That was about the EPI product itself. Uh, we are very mindful that having an excellent technical product does not imply that this would be adopted or used. There is no point in having an excellent technical product if it is not adopted. Likewise, you can't have a bad technical product adopted. So over the next two slides, I'll go to the high level tasks that needs to be done in order to maximize the possibility that this solution would be adopted. We've identified three key pillars or three key things that would need to be addressed. Uh, sustainability and scalability. What happens when Pharma Ledger project ends? Uh, Pharma Ledger ends at the end of 2022. So in order to continue the work that has been done so far, we need to put something in place. The something is what we refer to as next gen or farmer ledger next generation. What this entity will ultimately call has not yet been decided. The second one is the adoption of the solution by the tech the, of the technical solution by the pharmaceutical companies. This and this includes all the associated processes and procedures that will be impacted. In order to have the solution adopted, then we need to have a critical mass of pharmaceutical companies who will have implemented the solution. This is important because ultimately the source of the data comes from the pharmaceutical company's systems of record. And last but not least is the market adoption. As I said earlier, having the best technical solution without adoption is not a measure of success. While pharmaceutical company adoption and adoption by the health authorities and other stakeholders in the market is of importance, all of this will ultimately be in vain if patients do not adopt this or if patients do not feel they can trust or find value in the solution. Um, in the next slide, I will give an overview of the high-level tasks that need to be considered for each of the three pillars that I mentioned above. Let's start with next generation or pharma ledger next generation. So why is this actually needed at all and why can't we just continue on as we currently are? Well, apart from the fact that pharma ledger is a project, which by definition means it has a defined end date, we also need to consider that in order to meet our regulatory obligations, a legal entity with a quality management system is required to implement compliance measures required by, for example, the EU Annex 11, the GXP computerized systems, or the US FDA 21 CFR Part 11 GXP electronic records, or the US FDA 21 CFR A20 quality management of GXP systems. Now, in also, in order to meet uh, the requirements of several privacy legislations, including but not limited to the EU GDPR, we must have a data privacy management system and assigned officers at a legal entity to maintain compliance. And finally, as defined in the Farm Ledger Grant Agreement, we have an obligation to define, establish and begin operations of a long-term sustainable entity to continue the work of the Farm Ledger research phase beyond 2022. So, as I said, Farm Ledger has an end date of December 22. So we need to stand up the legal entity, and this comprises of things like governance and the stand-up of the QMS system. Once these are set up, we can then start to consider the operational phase. One of the first tasks will be the qualification of the EPI product, and then the development of this, and the development and onboarding of additional use cases. The next pillar to be addressed is the pharmaceutical company adoption. Uh, here we have to consider not just the technical IT implementation, but we also need to consider the internal processes and procedures required in order to sustain the solution for the long term. While the implementation approach will differ from one pharmaceutical company to another, most will roughly approach it as follows. Um, the implementation of a development system where, the te where technical testing, integration into the systems of record, followed by more testing will be performed. Uh, while not shown on the diagram, most companies would also have a test or quality system where they would perform the qualification activities before moving to the production environment. All of these steps are necessary in order to make sure that we have a fully qualified and validated system. We do all of these tasks to ensure that we can provide trustworthy data to the patients and the health authorities and that we have a long-term sustainable solution. Once the production system is operationalized, we then need to qualify the EPI package that 
the farm later next gen would deploy. Once deployed within the pharmaceutical company, we would need to maintain the validated state, which, inclu- which includes updates and bug fixes. Again, all of this is required in order to have a trustworthy and sustainable solution for the long term. The last pillar is the market adoption. And this starts with engaging with a number of markets to find out their interest or willingness to be part of a groundbreaking approach to building a trusted digital platform for patients to manage their healthcare needs. Now, you may be wondering why I'm saying that, considering we have we are just discussing EPI, right? Well, what we, the pharmaceutical companies and the public partners, including the participating patient organizations, are building is not just an EPI solution. EPI is a first step in this journey towards this trusted digital platform for patients to manage their healthcare needs. If we were only looking at EPI and not beyond EPI, then we would not be doing what we're doing as part of this consortium. I hope that gives some idea of the thought process behind all of this. Now, it is likely that some markets will process or proceed faster than others, and some markets may not even lead initially to a proof of concept or a pilot. And this can depend on many factors such as resources or other priorities. I think it is important to have a pilot in mind when engaging, as there are many facets to be considered, such as the scope, which products, for example, to use, the goal, what do we all want to achieve from this, and then we need to start preparing the products for the pilot itself. This takes time, and we have to consider potential artwork changes and potentially regulatory submissions. One of the obvious things that we would need to consider is how would the patient or person participating in the pilot actually know where to get the app and whether the products or pro- the product or products they have is, are actually part of the pilot or not. Um, once the pilot is agreed, then we need to execute the pilot, evaluate the results and determine the next steps. It is likely that the results will lead to additional updates and functionality being built into the solution in order to meet the needs of the various stakeholders. Uh, we would like to have more than one pilot running through 2023 in order to get more feedback from different stakeholders and from different parts of the world. I hope the last 13 minutes or so provided some useful insights into what is planned and why it is planned. In closing and before handing back to Martin, I would like to summarize a number of things. Um, this is not just a technical endeavor that we're undertaking as part of Farm Ledger. It may seem that way from the discussions around blockchain, enterprise wallet integration into the systems of record, validation, app development, etc., However, these are just the necessary underlying aspects that need to be in place in order to build and operationalize the vision for a trusted digital healthcare platform where patients can manage their health needs. And now, having said that, I do have to give a big shout out to all the technical subject matter experts that have done excellent work so far and have overcome many challenges. As a result, we now have the blockchain nodes from five pharmaceutical companies connected. This is a major achievement for us. The excellent collaboration between all the parties and the relationships that have been built has been amazing. For me, this has been one of the major achievements of Pharma Ledger. Without this, then we would not have achieved what we have. Now, the next goal will be to connect more companies, including some of the non-pharmaceutical companies. Now, as you heard earlier in the webinar, we also have some excellent sessions as part of the patient engagement workshops. These were really, really excellent sessions. We also need to be mindful of persons that do not have access to to technology or that are not comfortable using technology and how moving towards a digital world will affect them. What we cannot have is a tiered trusted digital healthcare platform. So these aspects are really important and need to be taken care of. And finally, um, we are at the start of this journey. And to be honest, we don't have all the answers, nor do we know all the questions. So the question to everyone is, would you be willing to come on this journey with us to help overcome the known and the unknown challenges in order to build a better and inclusive future. It is very important that this platform is inclusive of all stakeholders and that everyone has a voice. This is embedded within the Pharma Ledger vision and it is also key for adoption. Additionally, there are some very interesting use cases that are being worked on such as clinical supply chain traceability, finished goods supply chain traceability. So please keep an eye out for these as well. Uh, We should also not forget the environmental aspects to this either. We often get asked if this requires us to set up server farms to run the blockchain nodes and to perform mining, etc., because this is obviously very energy intensive. Well, the answer to this question is no, we will not be setting up server farms to do mining, etc. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I will now hand over to Martin to get the results of the polls and open up a live Q&A. Please ask any questions you may have, and we're looking forward to your engagement.